Okay, so we'll continue now with our uh, second session on the adab and akhlaq of Islam. Again, just to situate very quickly for those who were not here in previous sessions, we said that our uh, understanding of the deen and our engagement with it as a spiritual uh, journey is effectively of three stages. That of learning the ahkam of the sharia, the rulings of the sharia, so that we can implement these things in our lives for our own benefit. Allah stands to benefit nothing, but we do. Uh, the tariqah, which is by what I mean here by this term, is our own sp individual spiritual paths. In other words, learning the rulings that Allah expects of us to implement in our lives, and then implementing them. This is our path. Okay, putting them into practice in ways that in my life might be slightly different than your life and might be slightly different than the person sitting next to you. Because our experiences and our moments and our challenges are slightly different. Okay? In other words, what might be easy for you might be difficult for someone else and, and vice versa. And so this is the spiritual path from which then our application of the Sharia and the wisdom and the ethics and the morals in it hits the ground. This is when then your, your, your test is your path. And this, inshallah, then manifests. If we are consistent with this, one day it's for us, one day we slip, one day we dust ourselves off, we try again, then you, you make another mistake, you try. But this const constant turning back to Allah, this tawbah, and implementing and trying to perfect it. I know I did wrong, I know I've done it a thousand times, I'm still not going to give up. I'm not going to give in to the nafs and the shaitan. I'm going to make a change. This leads ultimately to the manifestation of the haqiqah, which is the realities of the world, the realities of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is then unveiling in his interactions with us, the types that we've just been talking about in the aqidah class at one level, um, the reality of matters. Okay, so in other words, the whole point of this is not just to have a long list. As we study, for example, what we're talking today, which is we're still in the section talking about the adab, the etiquettes of food, and dealing with food and people and serving people. It's not, again, to have a long list of do's and don'ts. It's not here so that we have a stick that we can beat over somebody over the head with if they don't do one of these things. You know, astaghfirullah, how, how did you manage not to do what it said in slide 17.3? Okay, the point is rather that we use these things to improve ourselves to know the limits of the halal haram and to know the, what's better and what's not so good as a path towards Allah and His pleasure and realizing uh, these things. So, uh, if we may just get back down now to where we were. So today, what we're, we've reached to in the section on uh, food and things related to food, is the order of foods that are served. That there's an adab in the sunnah. Again, we defined the sunnah previously as those actions or sayings of the Prophet or the things that he accepted tacitly or explicitly. Um, and by extension, likewise, the way in which he, as the perfect human being, acted. So we take notice of these things. So if the Prophet ﷺ, for example, ate in a certain way, it might not be that it's obligatory for you to eat in that way, but still, notice it. Try to derive something from it, benefit from it. Try to implement it. Okay? So, of the adab of how we eat and the order of eating, it's mentioned, is to begin with fruits and vegetables, if these things are available. Let's say you're about to eat, and there's a number of foods in front of you, to begin with these things. Followed by any meats or composite dishes, like my beloved lasagna, right? Composite dish meaning there's some wheat and there's some vegetables and there's some meat and there's some, so this is a composite dish. And then anything sweet thereafter, followed then by some cool water or using just room temperature water to wash the hands as well. So the ulama mentioned that this is something that was noticed again in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and that this is something that people with experience also know is good for the human body. Okay, so if the first thing you eat is some fruits or some vegetables, i.e. those things that then if you hit it with things that are heavier, they help with the digestion and the absorption. Okay, Allahu Alam. 
that you know these fruits and vegetables are digested faster, and thus they should sit at the base of the stomach when beginning uh, a meal. Allah knows best. Uh, this is derived in part also from the ayah uh, in, this, in the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began first with fakiha, which are fruits and vegetables, i.e. produce, that they choose, that they select, and the meat of birds that, uh, that they desire. In other words, that Allah is ordering in the Quran, there's an ishara. Again, this doesn't say it's fard. Somebody eats meat first and the vegetables perfectly fine. But that there's an indication in, the, in here of beginning with these and then going on to the heavier foods, so to speak. Okay. Now, as far as serving others food, that it's from the adab of Islam to serve others with the most pleasant of foods first, giving them a chance to enjoy it fully and thus not eating too much, you know, overeating, so to speak, afterwards. To do the opposite is against the sunnah because it over... Uh, it encourages overeating. In other words, you're at someone's home and you see out of the corner of your eye that there's a really nice dish they're about to serve. But first they're giving you dishes that perhaps aren't so nice. Yeah, meaning you don't like them as... But they're being really, really insistent. You, you eat them, but your heart's really on the other thing. And so then when you finally get there, you've already eaten a good amount, but you're going to keep eating because you really like lasagna, of course. Uh, what else would there be? And so you end up overeating that. Now you've gone against the sunnah, and the host has, perhaps unwittingly, encouraged you to go against by overeating. That's going against the sunnah. So what is, what's the adab? Put the more pleasant things first, that you know that the guest likes. Let them have their fill, and then they can stop when their fill has been had. And again, what your fill might be, might be different than what somebody else's fill might be. Okay, so the point isn't an exact amount. So to serve others with the most pleasant of foods first, thus giving them a chance to enjoy it fully and not to eat too much afterwards. And so observing the sunnah of not overeating. It is from the sunnah of the early Muslims um, to serve various dishes at once. So, you know, if you go to whatever, certain settings, you know, here in England or in, in Europe, for example, in general, the custom is to serve, you know, one dish let's say whatever, a salad or a soup, and then they remove it, then put another dish, then remove it, and then put, you know, the third course or the fourth course or whatever it is. And that's fine. There's nothing haram about this. If you're invited to someone's house and that's how they serve you, that's perfectly fine. But it's of the sunnah of the early Muslims to serve the various dishes at once so that each person can simply select what suits them most. It might be that one person really likes, you know, the lasagna, and the other person really likes the biryani, and that's fine. Then those who like the biryani can have the biryani, and those who like the samoan, those who are on a diet can have some vegetables and, and just some yogurt and call it a day. Okay, by putting it all out, and then you notice that throughout the Muslim world, if you travel, this tends to be what Muslims do. Okay, it's now, it's just been encultured, it's not something they necessarily reflect upon, but this has been built over the centuries into the culture. Again, there's, it's not to say that it's haram to do otherwise. It's just to say that this is from the sunnah of uh, the early Muslims. Okay. If one, has, as, if one is a host and you're, you only have one dish, then to make mention of this. So that if the guests are there and they might be afraid that, well, if I eat too much now and they, you serve me something else, I might harm your feelings by not eating it. Well, no, they, they know this is the dish that you have. And there's not, again, there's no, nothing shameful about this. I mean, early Muslims used to eat simply one dish. So it's not being better or worse. It's not say you're a better Muslim if you have five dishes and you're a worse Muslim if you only have one dish, but then you have to apologize. The point simply being is if that's all you're going to put, in some fashion mention this so people know that they should have their fill of this. Okay? And finally, if you're serving... Yes, there's a question. It can be, but there's this, again, as we said, there's no harm in having multiple dishes. Uh, the sunnah is to eat simple. And so what we've talked about in the previous weeks, as, as everyone will recall, was that you know, they, their foods used to be not very complicated. 
I mean, I, I doubt lasagna would have been, if I'm being honest with myself, would have been served by the Sahaba. Uh, it's a complicated dish. You spend half the day preparing it, etc. But the point being is if you're going to have more than one thing, to put it all out, and if you're not going to have more thing, whether the intention is to, again, do it simply, which is fine, or it's out of necessity, I'm perhaps in a moment where financially things are a bit tight, I still want, that should not prevent me from serving other people, right? Because what you often have is that people, when they feel that, oh, well, I'm, I'm not doing so well financially, I'd be embarrassed to only put one dish for someone. No, you shouldn't be embarrassed. There should be no embarrassment at all. A person shares what they have. Allah determined this is the wealth you have. Allah determined you've only got one dish at home right now. Share it. That's the karam. That's, that's the generosity. Generosity isn't when I can afford to put 90 dishes. The generosity is when all I can afford is one dish and I still share it. Do you see? So the point being though simply is that if there are guests and in that society or in that community or in your household they're used to having multiple dishes, which is fine, to mention there's only the one so people don't hold back and they have their fill. Okay. Now what the intention behind it could be what you've mentioned. It could be living simply and that's all fine as well. As long as we don't start enforcing that on people because the Prophet did not forbid people from eating more than one thing. It's just that's not the way that he, generally speaking, went about things. Okay. Good. And then finally, as we said, from the adab is to serve and to eat delicious and good foods. Why? Because this bequeaths a happiness, a ridha from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes people think, I'm going to be more religious, I'm going to eat coarse food. I'm going to be more religious, I'm going to eat things I don't like. Now, if you're doing that to train the ego, the nafs, your desire to get used to living a bit rough, there's nothing wrong with that. You go on a camping trip, and part of your intention is to remember, I don't always have to have the luxuries I have. That's a good thing every once in a while. The ulama, you know, of the Ahl al-Tasawwuf, the scholars of the heart, they used to send their students off on trips just to break the habits. Go travel, go visit so-and-so, go visit, go do Umrah, go, break your habits. Realize you don't need to have four meals a day and you don't have to sleep eight hours a day. You can, you can rough it out a bit. It's part of life. So that when you really need to, you know how to. Okay? And to have some perspective in life. That's perfectly fine. But also, the point of being a Muslim is not to go without. Just like the point of a Muslim is not to have. In other words, zuhud for the sake of zuhud, doing without in this world, for the sake of doing without, is not a virtue. Doing without for the sake of Allah is a virtue. But if Allah gives you, and you enjoy it, and you thank Allah and see it from Allah, this is a better virtue, somebody who's, I won't eat it, but they really wish they could eat it, but then the whole time they're thinking about how I wish I could eat it, but I'm not going to eat it. And Do you see the difference? In other words, we're not here to do without. We're here to do without when it's better to not have something. This is the point, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what they're mentioning is that all things being equal, no, eat things that you enjoy and have shukr. Be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beauty is part of life. Allah jamil yahabbil jamal. Allah is beautiful and loves things that are beautiful. So having, again, simple, not being extravagant in one's dress, in one's home, in one's foods, in one's wealth, not being ostentatious, but having and being grateful for what you have is of the sunnah. And again, as he says, it, why is this better? Because it bequeaths happiness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think I mentioned this perhaps in a pre previous uh, session, but in case I didn't. You know, one of the great uh, awliya and, and scholars of our ummah, Abu Hassan al-Shadri, in his time, it was about, what was it, 12th century of the common era, about six. I think 6th century roughly of the uh, Hijra, or maybe a little bit later. You know, there were Muslims and there were people of the spiritual path especially who would intentionally wear only rough things, intentionally only eat rough things. They would, you know, only, you know, one of the things they would do is they would only drink, they would never drink cool water, that this is kind of giving in to the self. They would only drink kind of warmer, you know, especially if you're in North Africa in the summer, it's very hot water, kind of warm hot water, that this will teach my ego. And so then, and he's one of the respected ulama and saints, and, and so they saw him drink cool water and they inquired, and he used to dress nicely, again, not extravagantly, but clean, beautiful clothing, you know, made out of nice materials. And when asked about, 
right? He said, when I, when I drink hot water and I say Alhamdulillah, it's kind of begrudging, right? I mean, if you drink something, he said, he said drink cool water, Alhamdulillah, my entire body, every part of me is thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is someone whose honesty with Allah was not doubted. So my point being here is that it's no more pious to be eating or drinking or dressing or living in bad conditions. And it's no more pious, of course, and to do the opposite just for the sake of Austin. No, the point is, if Allah has given you, enjoy it and simply and share it. Okay, and so that one is happy with what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has destined for one. Now, if those things become a distraction from Allah, that's different. And the Prophet was gifted sandals once, and he was wearing them in his prayer, and his eye looked down upon them. He finished the prayer, and he gave the sandals away. Not because it was haram to have those sandals. He accepted them. Obviously, it's not haram. But because they distracted him. So if the thing that we have distracts us, give it away. We're not attached to the thing for its own sake. And we're not against it for its own sake either. Okay. From the sunnahs of serving, thus building upon everything we've just said, is not going overboard, but rather serving that which is available. Okay, so this follows from the previous question and discussion. One should not be ashamed of what one has or does not have. What one has or does not have is from Allah. To be ashamed is to effectively say, Allah hasn't done right by me. Allah protect us from this attitude. I have simple, I share my simple things. I have a lot, I share my lots of things. Okay, but not going overboard. So this means what? Not having takalluf, as it's phrased. Okay? Things are a little bit difficult. I don't have that much money right now to spend on, let's say, um, you know, very lavish dinner parties. But I feel embarrassed because that's what society does. And so I end up going and taking a loan, or a haram loan even worse. For the, No, this is going overboard. This doesn't please Allah. If the guests found out about it, they wouldn't be happy. Right? We've now impo- they'll feel they've imposed upon you. Okay? So keeping things then within what is reasonable. And what's reasonable for one person might be unreasonable for another person. Again, it's relative. So we're not here to judge others. Somebody has a dinner party and puts out 50 types of food, that might be the easiest of things for them because A, they're a chef and B, they're millionaires. It's not a big deal. And whereas somebody else might put out one type of food and they've even given everything they've got and that might be better. Okay, so we don't judge the first and we don't judge the second. But our own attitude should be to do it within what is reasonable for us. And each person knows themselves. Of the sunnahs of serving is not to say to a guest, would you like me to serve some food? But rather simply to serve it. If you ask, it's as if you are being imposed upon. So someone comes and you have some food, simply start serving them. One of two things will happen. Either they'll eat, Or they won't eat, and if they don't eat, you pack it up and put it away again. And if they do eat, they haven't felt shy to ask you for it. Okay? So somebody is around, you don't come say, would you like some tea, (laughs) per se, but rather you say, would you like tea or coffee, Uh, for example. Now, they say, I don't want anything, that's perfectly fine. We don't force it upon them either. But the point is not, oh, I don't wish to trouble you, and... No, make it where the availability is there and you're just asking which type you'd like. This is from gra- gra- graciousness. So they said not to say to a guest, would you like me to serve some food? All right. Would you like to stay here or is the, is the, ho- is the hotel a bit more comfortable for you? you know, nudge, nudge. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock, why don't you get going now? Rather put out the bed for them. Get and if they want to go to the hotel, that's up to them, but you've made everything available. You've done your duty. Okay? Okay? This is from the Adab. It's a subtle point, but a very, it changes the dynamics of how you host people. Now let's talk a little bit about the food of others. Okay, we've started talking about it in the last session, so continuing. The guest should not suggest that food be served. This is bad manners. Neither explicitly by asking, when are you going to serve the food already? <laughs> I've been here for half an hour, I mean, I'm really happy to talk to you, but... You know, I can smell the chicken roast, huh? Okay. Or by means of glances. You know, keep looking over at the dining table, looking at your watch, looking at the dining table. 
Rather, what the person should do, of course, is be patient. You're there, perhaps the host is running late, maybe the, you know, the lady of the house is preparing the food that day and she's running late, she, her kids were a bit ill, or, so be patient. Okay. Um, and not to explicitly, uh, this, is, this is of bad manners. If the guest, guest is given the choice of two foods, the guest should generally choose the easier upon the host. If the one is very difficult and one is very easy, then suggest the easier one. Okay, now if they're equal, choose what you like, as we said earlier, especially if this will bring happiness into the heart of one's uh, guest, or host, excuse me. Now if the guest knows that the host will be happy by a suggestion, this is different now. The first category, you don't know the person so well, or that's the default, should we say. Down here, you, the host and the guest are on intimate terms. They're good friends. They go back years. And the guest knows that the host will be happy by a suggestion and knows that it will be easy for them, then this is fine. And there's no karaha, there's no dislike in doing this. Quite the opposite, you might be rewarded because you've given them the chance to make you happy, which is what they want. Okay? So again, this is why you'll find among some of the books on Futuwa, on uh, chivalry and on selflessness, that amongst real brethren, there's no harm if you walk into their home, take something and walk out. Now, the condition is that you're real brothers, real sisters. I mean, it's like that. Meaning you know they would be happy and you know they wouldn't mind. Now, if you're not sure, even with someone you're very close with, then don't. Okay, this is a different issue. So we'll continue, we'll come to this point. It is not of the sunnah to intend to visit a people in the knowledge that they'll be eating at this time. So you know that your neighbor comes home from work at 5.30, and because you're a neighbor, you can hear the clanking of the plates at about 6.15 every evening. And so at 6.20, you... I was just thinking, I wanted to talk to you about the guard. Oh, you're at dinner, I'm very sorry to impose. Do you have a few minutes? So you kind of force yourself into dinner. They're saying it's not of the sunnah, obviously, to do this, to intend to visit a people in the knowledge that they eat at this time. For this will catch them unaware, and of course it'll pain them. You know, either they do, maybe weren't expecting you, maybe they had somebody else around who might not be suitable to, to mix with, whatever it might be. And so we've been prohibited from doing this. Again, you might think this is common sense, but remember, these adab are enshrined in the Sharia because different times and different places people have different customs and sometimes we lose sight of the bigger picture. Okay? So in other words, one should not go, if one's not on familiar intimate terms with someone, where walking in on them would be normal, in fact they'd make them happy, at times of meals one should desist from visiting other people, in other words. Why? Because it'll impose upon them. Okay? If one is hungry, and thereby intends visiting someone who is, however, a close friend, a brother, so that he may feed him, but doesn't target the time of their meal, so to speak, there is no harm therein. Again, this assumes some familiarity, and it assumes an honesty with Allah and an honesty with, with the people, which is to say, I'm not going to lie to myself, I am hungry. We're living, for example, in a time in which perhaps food is a little bit scarce. That person has more. I don't target them at the time to put them on the spot, but I do come with the hope that they might be able to share something. There's no harm in this. Do you see the difference between the two? This is actually a form of not having takalluf itself, which is to say, not, be, not putting on airs, oh no, I'm not hungry, and you're dying. You are hungry. Well, be honest with your brother. If they're really a brother, really a sister, be honest with them. They'd be harmed to think that you didn't trust them enough to be open to say, no, I'm sorry. You know, things are a bit rough now, I, I could use with a meal. Okay, clear? And so to see this, in fact, not as you're imposing, but Allah creating an op opportunity for you and for them, by means of you. Okay. Um, if one arrives at a friend's home to not find and they don't find them. If you go to your, your you know, close friend or a sibling, your uh, sister or brother, you know, blood, and, you're, and you are close, and you're close enough, and you're certain that the friend would delight in your making yourself at home, then this is halal, it's permissible to do so. The general rule we heard earlier is that it's not, of course. You can't just walk into somebody else's home, raid their kitchen, uh, sit down, make yourself comfortable, take a nap on their, on their bed. Okay, this is haram. But if you're close enough where these things are either explicitly or tacitly acceptable, then there's no harm in so doing so.
okay, without explicit permission. Either they've told you this in the path, past, or you've just become so familiar with one another that this is what you, know, you, you do, it's just developed into a custom between you, then there's no harm. Again, you might actually be rewarded, and they'll be rewarded for having um, made you at such ease. Okay. If one is, again, availing one's home and wealth and food, one should be generous with the portions that one leaves to his fellow diners. Let's say you've invited someone over for dinner, or you're dining together, you go out to dinner together. The, you know, you're not here in a competition to out-eat one another. Quite the opposite, you should be trying to leave more for one's friend. So the aim is not to eat more than the other, which is forbidden if it's done without their acceptance, no matter how much shared food there is. Well, rather, one should prefer one's co-diner, so to speak, whether you've invited them out, they've invited you, you're at their home, you're at a restaurant, whatever it might be. You should prefer the others to oneself. So you'll often notice, again, in Muslim cultures, people will stop when there's just a little bit left, out of hope that the other person will eat it. Right? As opposed to the kind of, you know, me, 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 you're differing um, to others here. One should not eat, here's a particular example, you can derive from it, you know, your own particular rule, two dates at a time. I mean, this is a way of eating fast, in other words. So everybody's eating, and they're eating with adab, each person is taking one, and you're taking two at a time. Obviously, you're going to end up eating twice as many as everybody else, which goes against the first principle we talked about. Unless this is the practice of one's fellow diners, or one asks permission, for example, at a host's home. Okay, it might be that you're, you need to eat quick and leave because you have an appointment. That's fine. Okay, but ask permission. Don't basically take more than is your uh, share. And in the same vein, if one's fellow diner, the person that you're eating with, appears to be eating little, one should encourage them to eat. Okay, as we talked about in the previous week. Though without saying, please do eat, more than three times. Why? Because this becomes excessively insistent then. Maybe they're, they don't feel well. Maybe they're a bit shy. They don't want to tell you that the food you prepared is not their favorite food. Whatever it might be. So you say it once, you say it twice. The third time they're still not eating, you leave them alone. Okay? Now, the, the opposite extreme is something that often happens in our culture, which is, please, you just put the food out and you step back you know, in our age today. That's also against the sunnah. Well, I, I made it available. If they wanted, they could have eaten it. No, you're meant to encourage. As we talked about last week, you're meant to serve them with your own hand. This is from the sunnah. Okay? So towards this, you know, just this, as you can see, what the, what, the point is not all the details, as we said. It's not slide 17.3. The point is the general attitude and approach to things you have and dealing with other people. Which is why Sayyidina Ali, karamullah wajah, Allah be pleased with him and ennoble his countenance, he said, gathering my brothers around a meal is more beloved to me than freeing a slave. You know, how weighty is it back in their day to have freed slaves? It's a great deal. I mean, as we know, it's one of the greatest expiations there are. He said, bringing my brethren around a meal is more beloved to me than even that. Sayyidina Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, he says, of a man's magnanimity, uh, magnanimity is, is the ex- excellence of his provisions when on travel and his expending these provisions upon his companions. So, you've, you know, when you're traveling in the old days, there wasn't every 40 miles a nice service station with six restaurants and M&S food and Krispy Kreme donuts and whatever it is. Right? In those days, you traveled, you went weeks without seeing another human being sometimes. So if you're traveling together, you took food with you, you know, things that could last. And so he's saying of the magnanimity of, as a, of a man is that they take and they share. Okay? And the companions used to say, gathering people around a meal is of noble character. It's a sign of, of husn al-akhla, of, of, of noble character. Okay, so the Sahaba, it's, it's related, for example, that they used to gather for the recitation of the Qur'an, i.e. for dhikr, and they would not depart except that everybody's eaten something. Which is why, again, if you go to a majlis thicker, for example, you'll see whether in Pakistan, whether in you know, West Africa or in, in Bosnia, people gather and afterwards they have something to eat and then everyone goes their own way. This is based upon in the, in the very sunnah itself. Okay, and there's many other narratives that one could mention towards this.
No. One has blessed one, you've had your food, you've eaten the food of another person, it's of the sunnah to pray for them. Again, think about all these points put together. What kind of society do you have? What type of feeling do people have towards one another? So look at the beauty of this dua. Upon eating of the food of another person, what should say? Allahumma akthir khayra wa barik lahu fi ma razaqta wa yassir lahu in yaf'al fihi khayra wa qanna'hu bima a'tayta wa j'alna wa iyyahu min shakirin. Oh Allah, increase him in his good, bless him with what you've provided him, facilitate his doing good therewith, i.e. with the things you've blessed him, grant him contentment with what you've given him, and make him and make us of those who are grateful. Okay, so not just eating and saying, you know, thanks, <laughs> which is not a bad thing to show thankfulness, but an outright prayer for Allah to increase them in their blessings, cre- increase them in their risk, and make it a source of good for them. Okay? This and other du'as, for example, can be found in uh, Kitab al-Athkar of Imam, Imam Nawawi. If one was fasting, then the du'a is slightly different. Okay? One has broken one's fast with a host. One should say to them, أَفْطَرَ عَنْدَكْ مُصَّائِمُونَ وَأَكَلَ طَعَامَكُمُ الْإِبْرَارِ وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ May those who are fasting always break their fast with you. Why? Because when you feed somebody else who's been fasting, the reward for their fast is, is shared with you without diminishing their reward in the slightest. May your food be eaten by the pious. What did we talk about last week? Uh, one of the last points. We said one should not intentionally feed those who are evil, doing evil deeds. Why? Because then you're aiding them in their evil. And one should seek out the pious because then by feeding them you're giving them energy to do good. So may your food be eaten by the pious, which will increase their reward with Allah, and may the angels send their blessings down upon you. Okay, so again, the ad'iyah, the du'as, a presence of heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while showing gratitude and increasing them, i.e. by your prayer to Allah and His inshallah answering that prayer in that which is good for them. And our author, Imam al-Nahlawi, he mentions just, I think he... Uh, Decided to mention a few of the hadith to do with food, uh, just one of the adaya. Uh, he says, if one drinks milk, whether served it or, or had it on one's own, the dua, Allahumma, this is taken of course from the words of the Prophet, Allahumma barak lana fi ma razaqtana wa zidna minhu. When the Prophet used to be served milk, okay, this is what he used to pray. Oh Allah, bless us with what you have provided us with this milk and grant us more. If he ate anything else, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, O oh Allah, Allahumma barak lana fi ma razaqtana, wa razaqna khayran minhu. O oh Allah, bless us with what you have provided us, and grant us that which is better than it. Okay, both of them are of course showing gratitude to Allah for what's been given. But the former, you can see that the Prophet ﷺ, as manifested in the famous, of course, moment where he was with Sayyidina Jibreel, uh, in his Isra and Mi'raj, and he was get, given a choice between wine and milk, and he chose the milk, right, the leban. In other words, that this is something that's intrinsically good. Now, somebody has a um, health issue where they can't drink milk. This is not to say, therefore, you force feed them milk and say, the Prophet used to love milk, you can drink it even if you die. The point is, those who can, <coughs> <coughs> to show gratitude in the way that the Prophet ﷺ uh, showed gratitude, okay? And not to put such foods down. That's also the other side. We're in an age where, you know, alhamdulillah, through study and through reflection, we learn of different, you know, new diets and new things that might help people with this disease or if you have that disease. This is all fine. But never to have an outright bad attitude towards anything the Prophet ﷺ liked. So I can't drink milk because I'm lactose intolerant, let's say. That's fine. Okay. But to say people were not meant to drink drinking milk, that's not fine. Because if the insan al-kamil, the perfect iman, the Prophet ﷺ, used to pray and say this prayer is specifically for milk, then this is something that, of course, then is a good thing and it is good for mankind. If it's not good for you, that's perfectly fine. Okay. But that's not the same thing then as saying, generalizing, therefore humans should not be drinking milk or humans should not be eating meat or whatever it is that the latest fad might be. Okay. Are there any questions thus far on this point? 
All right, fine. We now move on to uh, another subset of topics related to food and to drink. And again, where some of the ethics and moral choices uh, might be reflected that you have to make sometimes in your life, which is eating produce, be it fruits or vegetables or nuts or things like this, that's fallen to the ground. So imagine that you're out somewhere, you're walking by somebody's house, and they have a small uh, garden, and it's whatever, it's September, a few months ago, as you know, trees full of fruits, apples, for example, around here, come falling off the tree. Can you eat it? Can you not eat it? I'm out in an orchard, I'm out in the open in the countryside, I find some fruit, I, I find nuts that have fallen, is it permissible for me to take them? Is it not? This is basically what we're talking about here. Okay? So here's the first category. If in summer days, you know, in other words, when fruits are plentiful, a person passes by produce that has fallen to the ground and wishes to eat from it, then we take a look at some of the particulars. If you're in a city, the assumption is that this fruit is on land owned by someone because most land in a city is owned. It's not common land. Okay, it's not public land. So if one is in the city, then you're not permitted to simply take that fruit unless you have the explicit or the implicit permission of the landowner. What's the explicit permission? Yes, hello, I noticed your fruit had fallen outside. Do you mind if I pick it up? No, by all means. That's explicit permission. Or a sign. Sometimes you'll drive by people's houses, especially in kind of country homes. They might have a little sign that's please help yourself to these eggs or to these fruits. They have, they have an excess of it. That's explicit permission. Or implicit, which is clearly somebody has set out some, you know, uh, some, some uh, tray or something so that people can pass by. In some cultures, that's how they share things openly without making it explicit. Then that's fine. That's implicit permission. Okay? Clear? So... Without this permission, explicit or implicit, in the city you can't just take fruit, fruit that you find that have fallen off of trees. Why? Because again, as we said, most property is owned by somebody. And so you assume that it's theirs. Maybe they were going to come back from work that evening, pick it up and make some dish with it. Okay? If one is out in an orchard somewhere, again, an orchard assume that it's a farmer who owns the land. If it is produce that will keep well, like what? Let's say like nuts, like walnuts or almonds or other things. That Then you can't take them. Why? Because even if they fall to the ground and they sit there, they have a shell, they're protected, and the farmer will come back later and collect them all. And even if it's days later, they're not going to go bad. Unless, again, you know that you have permission. The farmer is your friend. The orchard is owned by your neighbor who tells, who's told you years ago, yeah, anytime you want, please go ahead and take some walnuts. And that's perfectly fine. If it's produce that will not keep, in other words, it's fallen and it's raining and there's bugs all over the ground and slugs and if you leave it there in two hours, that no one's going to want to eat it. It's going to get so disgusting, no one will ever touch it. So that's been wasted, effectively. Okay, then in this case, there's no harm in taking them. Why? Because as we said, the food will go to waste otherwise. So long as there is no explicit or implicit prohibition from the landowner. Now, maybe the landowner intentionally overplanted certain trees to fertilize the ground. Okay, sometimes people plant things to serve as what they call green fertilizer. They let it grow, they let it wilt, and so it just re re um, rejuvenates the earth. If they've said, please do not touch, please do not take, even if it's rotting, even if it's going to rot, you can't touch it. Why? Because it's their land, that's their decisions between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? If they had a good intention, then it's fine. If they had a bad intention, it's between them and Allah. It's their property. Okay? Is this clear? Do you see the differences here? The point being is we're not trying to waste... Oops, that top slide is slightly... No, I'll try to make my slides smaller next time. Sorry. The point being is that we respect A, people's private property, and B, at the same time, we try to do right by the thing itself that Allah created. Okay, so we don't let it go to waste if we don't need to. And at the same time, we don't take from people's private property without their explicit permission. Okay. Now, 
that was the example of an orchard. What if you're out in the village or in the countryside? I don't know if that's very clear at the top there. Again, similar reasoning. If, you're, if it's produce that will keep, um, then one is not, excuse me, I didn't translate that very well, then he is not, per, yeah, not permitted to eat it. A person is not permitted to eat it unless he knows that the permission is given. If it's produce that will not keep, and there's no harm in taking it, then go ahead and take it, so long as there's no sign of prohibition. So far, it's the same thing as the previous slide. Now, out in the countryside, the countryside might be privately owned land. You don't know. It might be commons land. It might be public land. Both are, of course, possible. Could be wild apple trees, not that any uh, orchard anybody's planted. If the fruit is still on the trees, it's superior not to take it out of precaution, unless it is an area replete with fruit. Okay, in other words, just wild orchards or, you know, sometimes you go out to the countryside and there's just bushes and bushes of berries. And you're walking along, you take a few berries, that's fine. Why? If it's so full and you take a few, even if it is owned by anyone, on that off chance, it's not going to cause them any harm. Okay? And as long as you know that eating it will cause no difficulty upon the people of an area. You're visiting from out of town. You're gone, you've gone off to the Yorkshire Dales for a holiday. And you're in the mountain areas and you find a bunch of, you know, again, wild fruit. And you start eating it. Well, you're the 9,000th person that day to have come from southeast England to go see the pristine nature of the Yorkshire Dales. And you're the 9,000th person to have eaten some of their fruit. By the time the locals come, there's no fruit left. All, all the you know, people who are impressed with the pristine nature have made it less pristine now. So the point being is don't cause harm to the locals. Be mindful of the people. If it's not going to cause harm, then it, one is permitted to eat it. If you think it might cause harm, then don't. Okay. But even if you do think it will cause no harm, you eat some then and there. You don't carry off a full, few bushels of it and drive back home to London. Or it's a little bit like going to somebody's house we mentioned in the previous week. They put out a spread of food. You can eat as much as you want there. You can't pack the food up and take it home with you. It's, it's to be eaten and to your fill there, not to have more that you take off with. Okay, so this previous slide and this slide, as you can see, the point is to have some respect for others, have some taqwa, and at the same time to be mindful of the utility and the benefits and the blessing of food. It's said that Imam al-Nawawi, one of the great scholars of the 13th century in uh, Damascus, in his, he, he died relatively young, or very young actually, in his early 40s. And despite that, as many of you know, he wrote some of the most well-received works in Islam, like Riyadh al-Salihin, one of the most famous compilations of hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, he compiled the book I mentioned earlier, Al-Adhkar, of all the dhikrs of the Prophet ﷺ, and many other works. You know, someone who's in a short life did very much. He wouldn't eat any of the fruits of Damascus. He would eat no fruit from Damascus, the city he lived in. Why? Because he said the lands of Damascus, the majority of the land is waqf land, it's endowment land. That over the centuries, from the time of the Sahaba onward, people had bought land and turned it over to serve the public. So maybe the fruit would be sold to support a school or a hospital or something of the sort. And over the years, people had usurped that waqf land illegally. And so out of his carefulness and piety and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he decided to refrain from eating any fruit, from, even though that's where he lived. Okay? Because he felt that too many people had stolen Allah's property. Once waqf is a waqf, once it's an endowment, it's Allah's, i.e. in safekeeping for Allah's creation. And so he refused. Now, I'm not saying this is a rule you, any of us must follow, and he didn't say this is haram. This was his taqwa. This is what his being on the safe side with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, something like this should be at least possible for us. Okay? Now, what if this fruit is found elsewhere? So, for example, you're walking along, and again, it's summer, and fruits are just falling off the trees or what have you, and you see some pears or apples running in a stream or a river, just being carried along, meaning they've already fallen off, 
meaning whosoever they were on whosoever land it was isn't going to be able to get them anymore because the river has carried them off. All right? What Imam Nahlawi mentions here is that such food may be taken out and may be eaten. Why? Because again, otherwise it's probably just going to get ruined. It's going to flow, hit some rocks, etc., and just sink and be spoiled. So it's permissible. Why? Because the original owner no longer, their property is no longer theirs. It's moved on. Now, you're walking along in the forest and you come across, again, a grove of, let's say, walnut trees or bushes of certain fruits or something. And these things have started to fall off in a little pile in an area or just within a small area, not a pile necessarily. So Imam Nahlawi mentions, if one finds a, a large number of, say, walnuts, this is just an example. It's not, <laughs> remember, this isn't just about walnuts per se. He's just using that as his example here. And he says a large number, meaning something like 10 or more in a kind of given small area, such that these things would have some value. If I was the one who owned them and somebody came and took them, I'd be pained because maybe I'm a farmer and I'm raising these so I can sell them at the market and feed my family. Okay. He says, if they're found all together in one place, kind of like in a pile, then this is like a lost and found item. What does that mean? If you find some money on the side of the road, what do you do? Well, obviously you pocket it and you go on vacation. No, what we're meant to do, even if that's what we usually do, is to try pick it off the road, ask around locally, has someone dropped this? If you can leave it in a public place that will, it won't get stolen, to do so, so the person can come back and find it. Or if that's not possible, then to keep it and to advertise that if anyone's lost X, you know, inquire with, you know, with me at my address at this such and such place. And you do so for, a, you know, there's some fifth disagreements, but roughly for about a year, depending on the value of the thing. And then after that, if no one still claimed it, then you can dispose of it. Then you can do with it what you want. In other words, you keep it in safeguard. This, you might say, oh, come on, it's just 10 wa walnuts. I can just go down to the supermarket right now and buy that for five pounds. Well, today you can, but in different parts of the world today and in different times in history, tell 10 walnuts might be a big deal. And again, if I'm a farmer, that might be something where I make myself a small little amount that I can support myself with, okay? So you treat them like a lost and found item. Either you leave them there if you think they'll be safe for the person to come get them, or you take them, but then you advertise that I found kind of a bunch of walnuts. I've got two bags of walnuts here that I found. I want to, you know, please inquire with me if you, you leave a note. If a person finds them dispersed over an area of land, then he may take them. It's possible to take them. It's permissible. You're walking along. You're taking a hike in the evening. You find a walnut. Half a mile down, you find another one. Two quarters of a mile down, you find three more. This is fine. These are just kind of random. You've gathered them together. Clearly, nobody's tried to keep these together. Just like a person who finds little pips or seeds you know, while walking along and takes them and eats them. All right. Even if collectively they have some worth. This is morally acceptable. This is acceptable. Wa alaykum as He says, similar are walnuts or any other nuts or similar things that have cracked and been broken on the ground. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if you paid attention the past two months when the apples were all falling over the place, sometimes an apple will fall and it just cracks open just from the force of it. If you leave that in two hours, it's going to go bad again. So that's fine to take even if it has an owner. And so he's saying the same. The walnuts have fallen on the ground, the, sh the nuts, the, uh, the shell's been broken, you can take it, okay? Because to leave it would probably be to waste it otherwise. The point of all of this, again, is not a long list. The point is to sh have an attitude, a way of thinking and reasoning, so that you can apply this type of reasoning if you come across other things, be they foods, or be they be, for example, in some circumstances, non-foods, all right? Moving on, if a person enters the guest house of his friend, all right, sometimes people have like a little area, maisonette or something just for guests, and partakes of something without the friend's command, as we've talked about in part earlier, there's no harm in doing so, so long as if the friend was aware, would not mind your doing so. Again, this is a sign of true uh, friendliness and brotherhood. Again, some of these things might be slightly repeated, but Imam Nahlawi is trying to underscore these, these points. Okay, any questions on any of these points here thus far? This one or the previous 
modes. Yeah. So that would come under this. If they're, where are we here? Uh, it could come just basically here, dispersed, or you know, if one is in the countryside, or if it's common land. Common land meaning like a public park, where then it's common, everybody has access to it. This is fine then. Okay. Again, on condition that you eat it then and there, not take every single piece of black, you know, berry off of every bush in the park, and you, you trudge home with five bags. Okay, because then everybody else in the neighborhood has been uh, <laughs> deprived from, from what you've so cleverly taken. Okay, does that answer it? Yep. So you know, if you're in a you know, different country and you're far away from the neighborhood, mm. and let's say you're in a park, for example, Mount Everest is not, you know, hiked for five hours. Yeah. <laughs> Again, then if one knows that this is, you know, common land, as we said, then you take what you need, right? You take from your fill. Not packing it up and taking it, you know. And you take one home to share with your wife, that's, but we're, we're talking industrial scale, you know, farming. No, one, <laughs> one doesn't do that, okay? If it's not common land, if you have reason to believe this is private land, be it a farm, be it an orchard or otherwise, even if it's out in kind of the forest, or, but you, you know, there's some, fences and you see a you know kind of a dog somebody's got a pet dog to guard the then you have a reason to think this is private land then one should not do this but you're out again just in the countryside this is the exact point of of this last this last one yes you can have some okay you pick some fruits you take some berries you to your fill and then two hours later you're elsewhere and you're hungry again you do it again okay but the assumption here being that it is common land, it's public land. These are very good questions. Any questions from the ladies? Okay. Fine. So some of the same logic now applying to purchasing foodstuffs that are usually sold by dry measure or usually sold by weight, but partaking of them before they've been measured or before they've been weighed. Okay, so for example, in most parts of the world until today, you know, having supermarkets is still not a universal thing. In most parts of the world, if you're buying rice, okay, it's going to be by, by weight. Right? If you're buying fruits, or it might be by dry measure, dry measure meaning you know, a certain type of uh, hold, um, a bag size or a, a smaller amount. Certain foods are so precious that they're sold by very, very small weights. Okay, or very small little bags or whatever it might be. So whether it's dry measured or by weight, that kind of food, okay, bushels of apples is an example of dry measure. You buy it by the bushel. I mean, yes, you can buy three apples today in a supermarket, but traditionally people bought apples by, you know, some dry measure. They didn't buy them by weight or by individual ones. It's fine to do so, but the standard was dry measure. So... If a person purchases some food stuff, which is usually sold by dry measure, on condition that it be so measured, either the condition of the seller or of the buyer. Like I said, can I buy a single apple from somebody who has some apples? Absolutely, you can. But if the condition is by dry measure, hmm, or by weight, on condition that it be weighed, in other words, that's the condition of the sale, or by count, I, I want three of those and one of those, on condition that it be counted and not be weighed and not be measured, it is prohibitively discouraged, makruh tahriman, which in the Hanafi language means effectively haram, to sell it or to consume it until it has been measured. I'm the seller, you're the buyer, you say, look, I'd like you to weigh me out from uh, that, whatever it might be, let's say grains, or desserts, or whatever it is, I want 10 kilos of, let's say, meat. That's a common example. And I cut what I think looks like 10 kilos of meat, and I just sell it to you. No, I made a condition. 
I said 10 kilos. I want it weighed. Okay. The other way around. I'm the buyer. You're the seller. Okay. And before you've measured it, I start eating it. Okay. I mean, you're not going to probably do that with raw meat, but you might do that with cooked meat, which is sometimes sold by weight. All right. You go to a kebab shop and you say, I want, I'm having some guests. I want 10 kilos of you know, prepared cooked meats or something else. You can't partake of it. It's makruh tahrim and it's sinful to start partaking of it before the condition has been fulfilled, if that's what the condition has been. Okay? It suffices that the stuff be measured. Now you might say, okay, does that mean that I as the buyer or I as this, I have to watch everything? No. I made it a condition or the buyer made it, seller made it a condition that it be weighed. And it's being weighed, and while it's being made, I take a phone call and I talk to my friend, but it's being weighed in front of me. I'm not watching everything, but it's being weighed. That's fine. The point isn't that you're like a hawk watching the person. The point is that the agreement is being, the condition is being respected. So he says, it suffices that the stuff be measured in the presence of the purchaser, even if he or she is not observing the, me the measurement. Or maybe they're not even knowledgeable about the measurements that are used. If, if I told you, you come and weigh it, I wouldn't know how to use your machinery. It doesn't matter. As long as it's being measured by someone who does know how to use it, that's fine. I don't need to know how to do it myself. Yes, there's a question. But if the setup, if the, um, you know, they, 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 they want to see the measurement, you know, good quality, whatever, so it's a paycheck. That's fine, because that's not from what you're buying. That amount that they're giving you is now a gift, it's gratis, right? It's, it's, it's on the house, and they want you to be, so it's a gift. Okay. The point is this thing, I agree to buy 10 kilos, but I want it measured in kilos or 10 bushels or whatever it is. Then A, the seller can't just do it by sight and B, I can't start partaking of it because then I might end up eating something that the person didn't notice and they add up more. Now you've effectively stolen from their wealth. But while they're measuring, they say, here, here's a free ice cream on me. And they're, they're serving you up, you know, some boxes of ice cream. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. The question is, um, you, you were purchasing, um, in our context, over the phone or online, mm -hmm. for example, you know, dates. Mm -hmm. You weren't advising um, hundreds of the dates, yep. and you're not present. Mm -hmm. It's only if it's on uh, in this condition that I want 100 to the dates. Because you're not present there, um, is there a problem with that? Is, is it no, the, the problem is only if you can make it a condition that it be measured, i.e. in front of you. I mean, the, the assumption here is that I'm, I'm emphasizing I want it measured so I can see it. Okay. But yes, it's a, a consignment is perfectly acceptable. You know, there's no problem with that at all. So is that question clear? The brother was asking, what if I'm ordering something over the phone or by the internet? Do I have to see them measuring it? No. The point is, if the condition is being made, the assumption is you want to see it being measured. But obviously, if I'm ordering it, again, I, I call someone up in, I don't know, we're from Uzbekistan, and I say, look, I'd really like you to send me um, a thousand kilos of this local sweet here, and I'm going to sell it in London. That's fine. That's a consignment. That's, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay? Likewise, it's not permissible to make use of items that are usually measured by length, like what? Like cloth, for example, before they've been so measured. Even if a condition that they be uh, measured uh, was made. Uh, let's see. It's not permissible or not impermissible? Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Not impermissible. Yes, I. Um, yeah, so this is a distinction from the previous one. It's not impermissible. It's not impermissible, and meaning it is permissible too. But he wants to underscore that whereas the assumption might be impermissibility. That actually, no, it's not impermissible, i.e. it is permissible here. Even if a condition that they be measured uh, was made. He continues, however, if the seller or buyer specifies a price for every length, so you're going and you want to make, let's say, a dress, okay? So you go to the cloth seller, who's also going to then uh, sew it for you. They do both things. If in the former case, it's perfectly fine. If, however, the seller said, okay, this particular meter of cloth on this roll is worth more than the next meter of cloth. Maybe because they had 
woven into it some gold thread or something of the sort. And the next meter doesn't have it because they know it's every three meters. Okay? If the seller, or buyer for that matter, specifies a price for every length, then it's not permissible. Then we go back to what we were talking about in the previous slide. Otherwise, what's the assumption here? Is that a roll of cloth is consistent, for example. Anything rolled, generally speaking, and measured by, it doesn't even have to be rolled, but measured by length, generally speaking, the assumption is that it's of a consistent quality. It's the same substance, it's the same thing. Okay? So this is why he's saying it's not impermissible. In other words, it is permissible to make use of them, even if they've been uh, asked to be me measured. So the person says, I want X amount. You provide X amount. They start right away working on it. It's fine. Okay, even if you didn't go back and double check it. Unless, unless they had said the first meter is 20 pounds, the second meter is 10 pounds, the third meter is 10 pounds, the fourth meter is 30 pounds again because they know where the gold uh, is, is woven in. Okay, are there any questions on, on this? So this is uh, consumption, meaning not now just foods, but also it extends to other forms of consumption. Okay, is that a question or just no question? Okay. Last couple of points and then we'll stop. Try to close at uh, 15 after, inshallah. Um, this is now a section which We'll just start today, but we'll continue in the next section, session, which is what animals may be eaten and which animals may not be eaten. Now, by definition, unless we're talking about things that are owned by other people, fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, these things are assumed to all be permissible to eat. In other words, intrinsically, they're edible. You don't have to do the biha on them. You don't have to check, you know, what kind of nut or whatever it is. Unless, unless a fruit or a vegetable or something is known, and we're going to talk about this next week, to be harmful to humans or to you specifically, that's a different issue. Okay, because in like a poison, then it's not permissible to take this. But the default is fruits and vegetables and nuts and other such things, grains, are permissible for human consumption. The flesh of animals is not the same on two accounts. Number one, certain animals, as we all know, are permissible to eat, and certain animals in and of themselves, like swine, like pig, are not permissible to eat. And number two, the basic rule of consumption is that things are halal until proven otherwise, okay? Unless, when we talk about consumption here, unless it's meat. Why? Because what does meat require, even if it's, a, let's say, a cow or a sheep, or, it requires dhabah. It requires, you're saying, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and slaughtering it in a halal fashion. Do you see the difference? So the general rule of fiqh is things are, per, are assumed to be permissible until proven otherwise. Okay? The only exception to this I mean, in the general things now, aside from consumption, are two things. A, animals, the eating of them. You have to check that they've been proven to be slaughtered. And B, having uh, marital relations, where one has to have an, an aqad nikah. There has to be a marriage contract. So the assumption, in other words, one cannot have marital relations with just anyone, only with one spouse. There's a condition before the relations can be had. And with meat, the condition is slaughtering a halal animal. Beyond that, that's the whole point of the previous few slides. I'm in the countryside, I see some berries, can I eat it? If it's public land, yes. The asl is that it's permissible. Then why all the other talk that we talked about? Because if there's good reason to think it's not public land, like being in a city or being in a, someone's orchard, then it's private property, that's why. But the thing intrinsically is permissible. Animals are not the same. As we said, animals, you have to check what kind of animal, and then B, of course, as we said, even the halal animals, they must be uh, slaughtered. So, in the next class, inshallah, we'll begin with talking about, um, well, we can just read this one quickly. Water animals, and in, this is according to the Hanafi school, so just be very clear now this particular point, uh, because the text that we're reading is from the Hanafi school of law, the Hanafi madhab. 
only what the only water animal, I mean animal that lives in the water that may be eaten in the Hanafi school of fiqh, is fish specifically. All types of which, meaning all types of fish, being permissible to eat. Okay. Salmon, crayfish, whatever you are, well, no, actually crayfish leave to the side for a moment. Catfish, whatever it might be, even if they're scavenger fish in the Hanafi school, they're deemed permissible. Okay. What this entails, of course, is for the Hanafis, non-fish, that animals that live in, the, like what, like lobster, like crab, uh, like um, frog, are not permissible to eat. Okay, water animals in the Hanafi school. There is some debate around um, prawns and shrimp. If you just, some ulama deem them to be like a fish, in which case it's fine, and some deem them to be more like you know crabs and things, in which case it's not fine in the Hanafi school. Just to be very clear, in other schools of law, like the Shafi school of law, these things are not deemed impermissible or even dislike, they're fine. In fact, I think in, in the other schools, I think it's only the Hanafi school that says this. So we learn one school and we live according to it to be on the safe side, but if you learn from an authentic scholar, or you hear you know, something transmitted from scholars of an authentic, that something else, that's fine. So you see someone eating lobster, you don't give them a hard time, why? Because in other methods, it's perfectly fine to eat lobster, okay? If you don't want to, because I'm from a Hanafi background, and I think it's disgusting to eat them. Then by the, don't eat them. No, it's going to force you to eat them. Yes, there's a question. What people eat shark? Mm -hmm. We're going to come to, okay, that's a good question, but we're going to come to uh, predatory animals in the coming slides, inshallah, so next week, inshallah. Um, the exception is fish that's found dead and floating, and belly up, in other words. Right? If an animal fish is dead, and it's been dead for a while, you know, the air, of course, in the diaphragm, it's belly up. This is impermissible, having died without a known cause. Now, you speared the fish and it died, that's fine. It's a known cause. You killed it so that you can bring it in and you can eat it. But if you find it dead and belly up in the water, then more likely than not, it started to go putrid. It's gone bad. It's going to be harmful. Okay? If dead but not belly up, it means that it's just been killed, then it's fine. Okay? And finally, all waterfowl, I, all birds of the, uh, that do, like ducks and other such things, they may be eaten. They're perfectly halal. Birds, even if they spend much time in the water, are not what was being talked about in the first slide. All waterfowl, all birds of water, okay, may be eaten. It's permissible to eat them. In the next session, inshallah, we'll continue with land animals, and there's a lot of details, so we'll leave that till that point. Are there any final questions before we break now on just what we've read today? Sallallahu barak ala Sayyid Muhammad Nabi al-Ummi, Tahir al-Zaki wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. Subhana rabbika rabbil azati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Qabla Allah ajma'in, may Allah accept from us from now.